Good afternoon. Hello. With these lights at this angle, we can't see if there's anybody out there or not, except for Bernie. He obscures all the light. So. You're welcome. Say, uh, this is the uh, Family Business Forum. So that's the, the session you're attending. Uh, up here, we have with us five members of different family businesses. So we have Rachel Jones from Triton Stone. Dwayne Nockween from Stone Interiors, Buddy Antra from Antra Stone Concepts, Mike Pico from Pico Engineering, and Alexander Zambrano. Huh? Pretty good. Yeah? It's Italians, get this down. All right. Um, so really quickly, we're going to have uh, the panelists introduce themselves. I would ask you to silence your cell phones. We realize that life doesn't stop because you're attending a education session, so if you do have to take a call, please just step outside into the hallway. Um, we will be asking you for questions, so digi diligently start thinking of questions you can ask, because otherwise I'll close the doors and hunt around the room and find some. That was humor. Okay. Must look very angry today. Um, so with that being said, I would, uh, we'll start with Mike. If you would introduce yourself and give Good us... Good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name's Mike Pico. Uh, we have a consulting company called Pico Engineering, and we're in, founded in 30 years, 30 years ago this year is so when we founded the company, my wife and I. At the time, we had a four-year-old daughter. Son was just born. Another one born two years later, but when we started the company, I had no idea that the two oldest ones would one day be working with us, so they're Two oldest kids are working with us. My youngest is in healthcare, so she's not in the business. And uh, we've been doing work in the natural stone industry right from day one. I worked with a fabricator contractor where I gained my experience. And in the, uh, we're doing consulting, shop drawings, engineering on, on facade projects and large stone projects. That's the core of our business. Thank you. Rachel? Yeah, hi, I'm Rachel Jones. I'm the vice president of Triton Stone Group. Um, we have a we have 22 locations across the Southeast and the Midwest. Um, we've been in business for 15, going on 16 years now, and it's you know been working with with our family since day one. My sister Katie is um, the president of the company, and um, you know my father was an entrepreneur in a different industry, but really helped us. Um, you know, opened the door for us to start our own company, and uh, yeah, it's been a challenge at times, but successful and always fun. Great, thank you. Buddy? I'm Buddy Antra. I'm a uh, countertop fabricator in Bridgeport, Connecticut. I put my name over the door in 2005, but have been working with Stone since 1982. I know I don't look that old. Uh, my son works for me. I've had, uh, he's 31 years old. He was actually born on my birthday. Um, and I've had my, my stepchildren work for me, and I've had my wife work for me, and I, prior to opening up my own shop, I worked for two of three generations of another family. And that uh, older generation was uh, hanging around when I started working for them back in the mid-'80s. Thank you, buddy. Dwayne? Hi, Dwayne Nockan with Stone Interiors. Um, we are a large-scale residential fabricator. And um, I'm actually second generation uh, in the stone business. Um, we started uh, back in the early 70s, my father with a high-rise commercial company doing exterior cladding. Uh, and then in 97, we opened up the stone interiors doing just uh, residential work. And uh, I opened mine in South Carolina in 01. Um, so obviously I've got the second generation side, but I also have my wife working for me, um, as well as a cousin and my brother-in-law too. So. Great, thank you. Alexander? Hello, my name is Alexander Zambrano. Um, I own Fabrizio and Sons Marble and Granite Restoration. So we work on the restoration side of things, you know, your chips, your cracks, your scratches, things like that. Um, my father actually opened up the company in 1985 in New York. In 99, he moved down to Florida, and now me and my brother own half of it. My brother is more so on the labor side of things, whereas I'm on the, you know, face of things and the business side speaking those things. So, yeah. Great, thank you. So I'm Tony Malazani, your moderator today. Uh, we're a third generation uh, ceramic tile, terrazzo, and uh, stone company in Great Falls, Montana. So 
Um, and I have a couple of my sons working for me, work with my brother, uh, father, grandfather. So yeah, it's, uh, you've come to the right place if, if you want to have a discussion about family businesses. I would like to do one little, uh, I guess, uh, highlighting of one company here, the Vanettons. How long has your uh, family been in the stone business? 123 years in Chicago. Amazing. Very good. Uh, with that being said, we, I have a, a few questions that we're going to get started with. So, Mike, so given the situation we've had the last couple of years, right, and your family that's involved and, and your business relation connection with your children, do you have an emergency management plan and, you know, an incapacitation plan if something should happen, you know, to you? Yes, I would say yes. I wouldn't call it an emergency plan because it's something I've been working on for a long time. Um, I read a book very early on when I started the company called Built to Sell, and it really, it's all about building a business that's not dependent on you. So setting up a management structure, setting up a team that can operate the company without the dependence of you being there. So part of my goal when I started the company was to to build a staff and you know we're 30 years old now I've got quite a few people that are you know 20 plus years with us as we grew we're, we're at a staff of about 40 now and growing looking for more people but I've got key staff in place that I mean I could go away tomorrow and the business should operate seamlessly so um, that's been a goal and we're in a pretty good spot right now my kids are working there. One's been uh, seven years now, my daughter, and my son's at five years with the business. They're not shareholders yet, so they're working their way up with the goal to have ownership, but I felt uh, it's very important for them to learn the ropes right from the bottom, start, learn the business, and when the opportunity arises, just like anyone else, they can start to be owners of the company. So they're at that stage now where they'll probably be working with our management team. And I've got some other shareholders that own some of the company where obviously my wife and I are still majority shareholders. And that's how we've kind of set it up. So they're, uh, from a business perspective, definitely we're in a good spot. Personally, there's always the challenge of, you know, we've got, uh, a daughter that's in healthcare, so she's got nothing to do with the business. And part of our legacy is, you know, the importance of having our siblings get along with each other. The last thing we want is for them to fight when we're not around anymore. So we've started on the advice of a friend of mine, that I, a, a good golf buddy of mine that we golf regularly. He's written a New York bestseller on family businesses. Um, and uh, he recommended that you have a family meeting, a formal family meeting every year with the kids in the business, kids out of the business, and it's an open book meeting. And we started that about three years ago, and it's been enlightening. The kids ask questions, we're totally transparent, we're discussing how the transition will go with the business and how the kids, will, the kids in the business will buy into it and own shares. And their growth in the business is independent of what she's doing in healthcare. She has an opportunity to buy shares just like the other kids if she feels that it's a good investment. So we have these open conversations every year now and like I said, it's been great. It's a formal meeting, we schedule it. We've been doing it at home but we're planning to do it like off-site one day and just go out. Cancun? Yeah, maybe, that, that's not a bad place. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's been, it's been great, and, you know, they know where all our assets are, they know where our things are, they know what's going to happen if we get hit by a bus tomorrow. We, we openly talk about all these scenarios. So I think it's really important that, you know, you look at the, all the what-if scenarios and start asking the questions, and I think it'll flush out and really clarify a lot of the things that you need to do to ensure that that legacy continues on the business side and more importantly on the personal side that your family gets along and you don't have issues with fighting over who has what and who doesn't have what. We've got a very 
a, a short story in, in Toronto, right? I'm from Toronto. There's a developer that has four boys, started a company. He was a Holocaust survivor, started developing one house, built an empire to 40, uh, $4 billion in real estate assets. And he's got four boys that are in court right now fighting against against each other for the four billion dollars that they're getting their way there's you know articles on 14 lawyers in in legal cases fighting against each other on these assets and the dad never had anything in place passed away and now they're all fighting so just a, a quick follow-up before we have a question with rachel but so your other shareholders is that this is another area I'd like to touch on. Are you using that as an incentive to keep some of your key employees engaged? Because sometimes in family businesses, you tend to lose some talent, lose some people, because there's kind of this, I hit the, I'm not a family member ceiling. It was very much part of the motivation for key okay. staff for retention. Uh, I mean, we had good bonus structure. We had, we're very transparent with, with our leadership team on how the business is doing, because we want them to contribute to the, the ideas on, on growing the business. So I felt it was important for them to have a, a real stake in the company, not just a bonus plan and a bonus structure for, for their contribution to the company, especially when they've been there 20 years. They've kind of earned their stripes. So part of the, uh, the shares were gifted and part they bought in. But we did a freeze on the value of the company. So really, the, the, the value of the company's frozen to a certain number and they're buying in the, in the future growth of the company. So there's some asset related to the existing part of the company, and then their shares will grow as the company grows. Great, thank you. So Rachel, growing up, you had a best friend, right? Right. And now you work for your best friend. Right. How's that working out? Exactly. Um, it's honestly, so like I said before, my dad is an entrepreneur. Um, he's in the trucking and warehousing industry. And, you know, he always nurtured that spirit of ours that he wanted us to, you know, start our own business. And when it was made apparent that we were kind of all going to, you know, be in this together, um, you know, our, my mom was really the one that, you know, came in and said, like, you guys are not, we're not going to have fighting between siblings. Um, you know, that's something that's, it's more important than the success of the business, your, you know, your family. And I think that because we have kept that base level of love and respect for each other at the forefront and something that, you know, we can time out and say, hey, you know, we need to take a step back and, and have a deeper discussion. Um, you know, I think that has been a huge reason of why I do truly still every day, you know, get to work with my best friend. I mean, she really is. And we're very different and alike in a lot of ways. Um, and something else that, you know, it took us a while, but, you know, really recognizing my strengths and, you know, maybe my weaknesses and her strengths and her weaknesses. And we really do balance each other out. Um, and, you know, we respect each other's positions as well. You know, she is in charge of obviously all of our purchasing and buying and expansion. And, you know, I'm on the marketing and the branding and the culture side. Um, so, you know, it's also having that level of like, knowing what we do well and and kind of sticking with um you know our strengths like i said and you still get the chance to go have girls days away yes usually they're at stuff like this <laughs> that's work but still you oh, know okay. no we do and my family i have six siblings um all almost all of us work within the businesses in some aspect except for my youngest sister, um, and she's a pilot. She flies planes for a living. She was like, I don't want anything to do with you crazies. I cannot work with you. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, we definitely, we go on regular family trips, um, and we're all extremely close and really very blessed that we, I think, had such a good role model in my dad because his family all worked with him. And you, know, you can really tell um, when you have that forefront of, of love and respect i mean the success in the business comes with that and and that nurturing of of people as they get older like you said you know if they don't work in the business they're still involved my youngest sister still comes to the fam the family meetings um you know and if she ever did want to work with us she could you know that opportunity is always there so um i do think that that's a you know a huge part of it great thank you so Dwayne, 
could you walk us through, you know, GKA retired what, about a year ago? A little over a year ago? Three, four, yeah. Oh, three, four? Okay. My wife says I do that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so walk us through your process with you, Mark, and, and GK, and how you guys, you know, basically put in place a plan that would allow him to exit the business and, and you know, well, <coughs> put you in the situation you're in now. You know, we kind of went through two family business scenarios in, in our evolution. And the first company we were involved with uh, was three partners, and one of the partners had many of his children in the company and kind of showed us a dysfunctional way to have family in a business. Um, so when ultimately we sold out of that and started the Stone Interiors, you know, initially everything was dad's. And, you know, I'd always told him, you know, someday I'd work with him but never for him. Um, and, you know, that was kind of our running joke. But, you know, so we opened the first Stone Interiors in 97. In 2001, we opened the one in South Carolina that was essentially my location. So dad lived in Alabama. I lived in South Carolina, and I ran the location there. Initially, I started off with a small piece of it as the managing partner of that location. Um, over time, we had another partner in our business at the time that we bought out, so I got a bigger chunk then. And then over years, as we had down years and things like that, I'm, all, I'm an only child, so ultimately, it, we all know it was, yes, it, it's very sad. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, we, we always knew that the, the goal was to ultimately transfer everything to, to me and my family in the most tax advantageous way possible. So as we had down years and other scenarios, there were periods when I would buy out additional pieces of the company from dad. Um, so about three or four years, well, as of right now, where I'm about 90% owner and dad still has 10%. But um, but officially, Dad retired several years ago as my, my mom got sick and all. But he retired and went out of the day-to-day -day business with her. But um, ultimately, he never really worked day-to-day -day in the South Carolina facility where I was. He was always there as a mentor and a guide and someone to talk over decisions with. But he was basically operating the Alabama location, which a few years ago we sold to uh, a cousin of mine. So I have a cousin running that facility. And, um, but dad's always kind of been in the background as that mentor. But since day one, you know, I've always, every weekend, every summer, every day off of school, there was no playtime. It was always, we're going to work. You know, oh, you got Friday off? Good, come on, get your work clothes on. And the same thing, where I worked from the bottom up, I was out there spraying weeds when I was probably 13 or 14 years old. Um, you know, I worked in the shop, worked uh, at the installation helper, um, bid jobs for him at night at home, things like that. So kind of always working at his knee, so to speak, when I was younger, learning the business so that by the time I was ready to, we were ready to start our location, I had a pretty good grasp on, on everything we needed to do to do that. Um, but it's always been great to have him there as that, that guide and sounding board when I wanted to just talk things over. Thank you. So, buddy... You've got your son, Joey, working for you, right? So my question to you is a little bit different. How do you keep that communication open? How do you find ways to connect with the younger generation, right? Because there's, there's a gap there, right? And since, yes. you're, <laughs> since you're Italian, you have this whole respect thing. Do what you're told before I tell you, right? So how do you, how do you keep that? to a point where he feels engaged, valued, right? And you keep that communication um, in, a, in, a, in a way, in a manner that he finds functional. I don't know how fast you can text. I find it completely, yeah, I'm a little slower than most. I have arthritic right? thumbs. Okay. So, um, so how do you guys keep it, you know, keep the, the family together, family relationship, but then also keep that communication with the younger generation? I kind of let him communicate with the youngers. I also have a, an office manager. I don't know if he's in the room or not. He's down here at the show who is kind of in between our ages. So there is kind of almost this little bridge. Um, you talked about the communication. And one thing that comes to mind and always comes to mind is I still remind him that when you're speaking to a customer or a homeowner, you say, let me ask buddy, not let me go ask my dad, you know, and it, it makes it a little bit more 
you know, appear more professional. But one thing that's happened is, um, you know, I've, I've always been more of a hammer and chisel guy. He's embraced more of the technology. He has uh, put this software for takeoffs and stuff. And I, you know, up until a few years ago, I never did any multifamily units. And he got involved in pricing some of that stuff. And that I was adverse to because, you know, I was like, oh, I, ain't, I didn't have to do that before. Why should I have to do it now type, type of guy, you know? And, um, you know, it, it, it's helped. Uh, my staff has, which is, you know, a handful of polishers and installers and one more office guy have, you know, embraced that technology a little bit, little at a time. Um, but he's kind of been a conduit and is our decision makers, whether they're the homeowners or design community are getting younger, it's nice to have that. Um, you know, I don't have any fancy stories of, you know, tax advantages or, you know, sh uh, stock sharing or anything like that. But, you know, when the time comes, um, it, you know, I think he's going to be more in tune with, uh, you know, the technology and the various things, whether it's the administrative softwares or our, you know, fancy CNC saws and stuff, than, you know, I will ever be, even if I immerse myself in it every day. So. Great. Thank you. So, Alexander, you just went through a basically a buy-in, right, in your family business? Right. Okay. So, can you walk us through the process you and your brother, your dad went through in structuring that? Because there's multiple ways to structure, obviously, that purchase, shareholder agreement. So, so what, what, I guess, the question would be, what professional help did you get? You know, attorneys financial planners, things like that, and, and how did you come to the point where you guys are where you're at now, and do you think that'll serve you well into the future? So I think, you know, Mike touched on it a little bit, right, but I'd like to hear your perspective as, you know, uh, a rock star. Yeah. If you didn't know that, by the way, <laughs> Alexander is one of the rock stars yeah. for coverings well, this year. So Thank you very much. Well, thank you. <laughs> so the hair is real. Yeah, oh okay. yeah, oh my, no, no sewing. <laughs> um, you know, that's interesting. Actually, finding the balance of the finances of how to buy my father out or, you know, the paycheck to give him, that wasn't really the hard part. His whole plan when building the company and going down to Florida was to hand it over to his sons. Um, just like Dwayne here, you know, growing up, if there was any off day, if there was a Thanksgiving break, a Christmas break, a Friday off, a summer break, I was, in, I was working. I was lugging water buckets, I was dumping out vacuums, I was mopping floors, polishing sides, behind doors, behind toilets, anywhere his hands couldn't reach, my hands were going into. So, you know, it was getting done. So that was his whole plan, was for us to take over. So it really wasn't hard to get him financially to agree, but the hardest part was getting him to trust me. My brother is 36, so he's older than I, I'm 27. Getting my father to understand that I could handle the finances, I could handle the taxes, I could handle the books, I can handle his old clientele plus the new clientele um, was very, very difficult. It was a lot of effort showing him that I could do it, showing him when he would give me a little bit that I would take in and run with it. You know, he handed me over his older clients little by little, you know, especially the very picky ones. We all have them in this business. People sometimes in the stone industry, they get a stone with veins and they don't want to see any veins and it makes no sense. And sometimes it's very hard to deal with and he wanted to see how I would problem solve, how I would deal with different people's personalities and their expectations, managing expectations. Because on the restoration side of things, sometimes people have travertine floors full of holes, pits, and you know they're 25 years old, never taking care of them. And so we have to manage the expectation of what is actually realistic when you're bringing it back to life. So. That was the hard part, was getting him to trust me. And little by little, over the last four years, actually, because uh, I came back into the business. I went away for a little bit. I met my wife in L.A. When I came back, I came back with my wife, and I, she was pregnant. And so when I came back, I was energized, and I was ready to take, in a sense, over the company. I was ready to run forward with it. And um, but little by little, over the last six years, you know, he's really been giving me full control. And now I am in full control of more of the back end and the direction the company is going, whereas my brother is more in control of the, um, like I said, the day-to-day -day work aspect of things. Okay, and so what kind of profession, did you have any professional services that you used to, to help you develop this, this buy-in? Uh, so no, no professional services. Um, I'm really on point of where our numbers are at as a company. Um, okay. I'm very good at it. And so 
I knew what we could afford to give him in one lump sum and then how much we could give him because we, how we did it was per week. He gets, uh, we do a deposit, direct deposit, but then that's how he gets his, what we call a founder pay. And so that's how we operate it. Okay, great, thank you. So now I would open it up for questions from the floor. Don't tell me you traveled all this way. (laughs) Come into this room and don't have any questions. Anybody? Yes, sir. He, there's a microphone. Would you use the microphone? Please? How do you come about with a valuation for the business where, you know, you could sell it for X amount of dollars for, you know, on a PE firm or whatever compared to uh, handing it down to your children? Okay. So I'd let well, Mike first. Well, we just first. went through that share structure with the employees that, that have bought in, and we had a business valuation done. So we had... Uh, a couple of scenarios and a couple of professionals actually value the business on what it would be on the market and it gave us a baseline to work with so we know it's worth x and um, that's where it's at right now so that we we had outside help to get us to that point i've had a couple of valuations done over the years and the year after i had a considerable profit it was worth this the year that my accountant got uh you know creative and i lost money it was worth this as far as paper is concerned. Now the value, a lot of the value of my company is me. And as, as Joey you know, grows into it and learns more and learns more about the, you know, the relationships, that's you know, where the value is, is, you know, is, is those relationships and customer base that I have developed over the years. I do a lot of work with the pickup truck builders and the, and the, you know, the guys in the vans and the, and the uh, 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 the decorate, you know, the design community and stuff. It's not a lot of formal retail, walk in, take it off the shelf sort of thing. Um, it's a lot of one-on-one. You know, people, I was talking to one of my builders and he says, well, you know, the homeowner got a quote from X for, you know, a little bit less. And he said to me, but you're my guy, okay? And that's, and that's it because we're gonna do what we say we're gonna do. Um, the value of my business to sell would be maybe somebody wanting to get into my market and as uh, Alexander had said about the, the, the payments per week, I got started through a family loan, like uh, my mother gave me my inheritance in advance, but all she asked for was a weekly stipend so she can have her money to live on. And that would be sort of the thing I would do with my son, but if he's not interested, then I have to look in a different direction. But every several years, I do have the brokers come in and value it, but that all depends on what my tax return says on the value. The, the other thing that I would add, is it a corporation, your business? Yes. Do you have a shareholders agreement? Yes. Is there a valuation in that agreement? Uh, I don't believe so, no. Okay. So that might be one place to start with as well. <clears throat> I know, <clears throat> speaking for me personally, when my brother and I bought out my father, um, was not a very pleasurable situation, still better than when his, his father passed away, um, but there was really a sticking point, kind of a, I'm going to own this till the day I die, and then you'll get your inheritance. Right? We, the two of us were the only ones involved, family of six, spouses. Um, so it really took some time to, to get our point across that, speaking to Buddy's comment, about that blue sky, that value, that ethos of your company business. And we had a really difficult time trying to understand how it was that we needed to pay for the ethos that we had really, to to go to Alexander's point, reinvigorated a family business. Because you really do have a cycle in family businesses where it it grows, it matures, it's great, it's awesome, and then it starts to kind of age a little bit, right? and you start to lose some of that enthusiasm, it starts to become a real drag for the principals to come in and work, you know, the older generations. And so those are all things that I think you'd have to consider in your, in your valuation. So, A, there are companies out there that can do the valuation for you, okay? Um, they're gonna wanna see, you know, if there's nothing in- included in your shareholder agreement, then or nothing spelt out in any of your 
corporate organizational documents, then, then they'll have some latitude. But for those of you who are, that are in that planning process, I would really encourage you to make that part of your shareholder agreement, especially if you're going to have people, which could happen like with Rachel's family, you could have, or, you know, Mike, you had family coming in, family coming out, don't always assume that there's not going to be the need to reacquire those shares, right? Um, so I'm curious, since you talked about it, how did you structure the, so let's say, or I, actually I guess it would be the pilot, it would be your family. So if your sister bought in, how would you, if she wanted to exit, she wanted to cash out her shares, do you guys have a process in place in the shareholder agreement for that? Um, yeah, I mean we would obviously, if she, if she wanted to buy in, she could, and if she wanted to, you know, not own shares, she, we, they would be, you know, redistributed between the rest of the siblings. Okay, and then you've got some type of similar methodology similar. if somebody... So if, let's say, the existing shareholders want to sell one day, we have the first right to buy it back from them, and if we don't, then they have the right to sell it to other employees. Yeah, so right of first refusal is a huge... I mean, that's pretty much the bedmark of what's kept our company together sometimes. So, um, any other questions? Oh, come on. Yes. There we go. Sat in front, too. I did uh, so, my husband owns his company, so it's just the two of us running it right now. But he has had his brother work for him in the past and some just work ethic issues, leaving my husband abandoned on projects. So me being the person I am, if it was anyone else, I would have fired him immediately. But because it was his brother, you know, it was a little bit, he wanted family to be involved. So how do you handle issues like that with it being family and versus just any other employee that you would have hired? If I may. It, Please do. Yeah. <laughs> I always look at it. So sometimes I actually deal with that close, close to my heart and it's with my brother. Um, I would say that I have a stronger work ethic where more so he's just looking for the end of the day and a paycheck, whereas I look at it more long term. And so we have a different, a different view on things. And when that does happen, I always try to remind myself, because it is my brother, and that we are family business first, first and foremost family. And so I would like, and I do all the time, I try to exhaust every option that I can to get through to him as first a family member before I refer to him as a, let's say, either an employee or a business person. Because um, I think that's important. I think it's important to remind ourselves that they're family, to a certain extent. I've had to fire both of my stepchildren. <laughs> so that's when, when that time comes. Actually, with my stepson, <clears throat> he, <clears throat> excuse me, he's got an engineer's mind, and he's very skilled, and he's brilliant. This is a kid that through school he wouldn't study, go into class, throw a pencil at a, throw a pencil at the test, and get an A minus, and then complain. Okay, so he learned, he learned everything. He learned how to operate everything. He learned the differences from this stone to that stone and the processes, but he would just start showing up whenever he wanted to and then yell at the other guys who had been in, you know, had been at work since seven o'clock. And it, 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 I didn't want to do it. I didn't, you know, my, I, I wanted to give him the opportunity. My wife was like, she finally said, fire him. And, you know, it still took me a month to, to, to fire him. And now he's in the plumbers union making more money than all of us combined. It, it is a hard thing to have to be prepared to fire a family member. Um, you know, I've had to fire one or two of my cousins several times. Um, they still come back at some point and, you know, have a better attitude, a different thing. I've got them, a cousin working for me now who I fired at least twice over, you know, the decades in, in different positions. Um, but you, if you're going to hire them, you've got to have that perspective that you can do that. And most of the time, they realize they're failing in the position anyway. Um, and it's, they're kind of sitting there going, geez, I'm surprised I'm getting away with this. <laughs> um, it, it, but it is much harder from your end to actually have to do it. I've been trying to fire my dad for years, but, you know. <laughs> um, so, but if you're going to make that move, you've got to do it. The other interconnection of that is, is when you're hiring other employees who are family. You know, I've got two husband and wife pairs working in our company. 
I've had a mother-son pair, um, you know, and you always have to factor that in when somebody says, oh, well, my, my wife can come in and do this or whatever else is, do you, how, how well do you trust them and, you know, how confident are you in that success? Because what happens if you fire the wife and does the husband go too? Does it, you know, so you just have to be really careful in those things and be really clear with it up front uh, with them that, you know, this isn't an all day thing. You know, I've had to fire the mother and just kept the son, you know, kind of scenario. So it, it's just, it is a sticky slope, but you just need to be up front and, and with everyone about how it's going to have to work. The other thing that I don't know the size of your company, but understand that how you treat family can have other repercussions as well. So if you have this like privileged class of people that are related to you who can show up late, do drugs, whatever it is, okay, and you go and let an employee, you let them go, you fire them for some type of behavior that you've condoned in a family member, that's pretty much business law 101 wrongful discharge. Okay, so understand that, that that treatment is a treatment that you should be applying to everyone to get back to what Dwayne's saying. So you can't let somebody go because they're habitually late or we just are dealing with a, a family member, extended family member that's kind of into the gig economy, right? It's like, well, you know, it's hard work, blah, blah. I can drive Uber, you know, so I don't really want to work, right? So... Understand that, that what you're doing with that is going to have some type of a bearing on how you're going to have to deal with your other employees. So, um, any other questions? A couple of questions. The first is uh, if you have a good set of core values and you hire and fire according to your core values, then you can get away with that a lot easier, just like you were saying, than having somebody get allowed to do it and somebody else not. And the other was a comment on, I've been thinking a little bit about how to to do my business to, to my children because I, I have quite a few of them working with me in the business. And I've been wondering about maybe doing a, a legacy trust or something and putting the business in it and then just have somebody as the director on that. So still owned by, owned by everybody, but I don't know how that's going to work. Okay. Did you, anybody look well, at I trust? Think the, are all the children in the company or only some? Uh, only some, but most of them are in management positions anyway. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I, I mean, with us having two in the business and one out, there's always the... the you know, how do you equalize that? If the two children in the business grow it to 10 times what it is now, is the third child that's got nothing to do with that growth entitled to that benefit in the future? Or is it the ones that have contributed to it? So that's always a difficult one to manage. And that's why our family meetings are kind of discussing things like that. What if it grows five times? Who, what happens? And I'm not part of it. And you know, Sue, my wife, are not part of it. It's the contribution of the two children that have grown it. The one that's, you know, a nurse in healthcare. I mean, is that part of hers at that point? So these are these are difficult things when some are in the business and some aren't. And I and I think that so speaking from my personal experience, on my my in-laws' side, they're they're farmers. So that farm, because of the size of asset, and that's the other thing too, you know, I, I guess what I would say is if you fail to plan, you plan to fail, okay? So these are all topics you should be addressing now, but with the size of assets of a, of a company, if that is distributed, you know, just basically based on some unknown escrow plan and it's not planned out, can be a huge financial impact on your family. You could end up losing the company because no one person can afford to put it back together. So legacy trusts have their place. I mean, depending on how you structure it and what you do for, for management of the company itself. Um, you know, 
there, there are a lot of options um, that, that you can explore. And I, that's what I would say is, you know, explore what's out there and what you can do and what you want to do. So I'm assuming, like, what you were talking about with a base value there, that sets that buy-in for, for the other family members or the other people in the company. When it exceeds that, you know, on the backs of the people that were responsible for that success, do they need to share in that? You know, is that fair? So, um, big question there. Um, any other questions? Okay, you're going to force me to do this. So, who's in a family business? Raise your hand currently. All right. Since you decided to sit so close to the front. <laughs> no. Uh, as a, I'm assuming, younger generation, multi generational family, or did you start the business? Second generation? Okay. So, what have you done to try to bring up to speed and technologically enhance the first generation of, of your business? Uh, actually, my father started the company, and his wife is a business partner. And we had like a lot of cousins and family working there. I worked there for one year once, and then I decided to go to my market field, that is digital marketing. So during 12 years, I had my own company, and they were my clients. I was doing the marketing for them as a normal client. And just about this COVID situation, they couldn't travel anymore. So I start to do the buying process all over Europe because I'm living in Portugal and they are in Brazil. So as the digital ma manager girl, of course, I have been introducing everything that they allowed me to. It's hard. I have been trying. So some of the younger people, don't make me come get you. See? It only takes one example. So my parents both own the business, my brother, myself, my husband, we all work it within the business. Um, but my brother and I, once we graduated college, we went, we actually did our own thing and then came back in to work with my parents or they asked us to come back and work with them. Um, but I feel like my parents started the business in 2004. They were using a lot of Excel, Microsoft Word, um, Outlook, for, which something's wrong with Outlook. So I kind of showed them, um, or I introduce them to the Google Drive, and a lot of our things are used on Google Drive. Um, same thing with like our project management softwares. There's a lot of things that my brother and I have, I guess, brought to the table with what we do. But it is funny, even though my parents are on the younger side, each generation can always bring more <laughs> to the table, I guess, depending on what you're looking for. Okay, so I would solicit an answer to a question which would be, how do the reactions of older generations who now cannot access that information? So we maybe could go flip open a ledger, look through it, and we could find all this information. But now we've got to have passwords, we've got to have access to different computer programs or whatever it is. So I'll, I'll let you, you two, <laughs> Dwayne and Alexander, so, uh, address this. But, you know, and I'd like somebody in the in the audience as well to address it, there is a real level of frustration, and I think yeah. to the point of trust, which was brought up a number of times, I, I think it's hard to give up that You, you hire that control. an IT person, and every time dad calls, you go, did you talk to Philip yet? There we Call go, I, I, IT He'll guy, help you there find we go, it. right there. <laughs> because you are 24-7 tech support. I can't tell you how many times I get a call at 8 o'clock at night, I'm trying to find this, and I, wh where's this at in the Dad, it's, you know, I told you four times, it's the go here, go there. Well, I don't like where that is. Okay, <laughs> you know. So it, it is a, uh, a fun and entertaining challenge of, uh, of trying to walk them through some of those things sometimes. Yeah, it's difficult. My father just learned how to reply on an iMessage. And so that was like a whole thing. Like, 
he would send me an address to a job, you know, I'd send an information back. And he was like, I don't understand what you're talking about. And I was just like, you got to just, you know, click the reply. What's a reply? And it was like a whole thing. And then since he's your father, he's yelling at you. And it's like a whole thing. Now you feel like you're in trouble again. And so, you know, it's a whole thing. But you just kind of got to like keep going, keep going, hold their hand, just like he said. Except for my father, it's like 4.30 in the morning. I don't know why he's up that early, but he is well, messaging me. Uh, and it, I'll throw one more comment on that, though, is a little more constructive, too, is I have to try to play that buffer sometimes so that he's not calling our controller and yelling at her about why he can't get to something and things like that. Um, so that is a step of trying to be that, that mediator to, to help. I don't want to say keep him out of everyone else in the company, but there, there is that level of frustration sometimes when they're trying to get to something they can't find. Something, you know, they don't do it every day anymore. And sometimes the, that, that frustration comes out on other employees or things like that and, you know, trying to play that middle person to make sure, you know, that everything runs smooth there. That number two pencil I used on the ledger, I wrote down all the passwords because I'm that guy who forgets the passwords, especially with some of these things that you have to change it every so often, and they hear me yell at the computer. Do you save them underneath the keyboard so you can just... No, I, I, no, no. I... Put I, them I, right I, on I, the screen so they're easy <laughs> to find. No, I have, I have a shoebox. <laughs> okay, so seriously, uh, so this is uh, something that, that we've tried to implement with our company. So how many people are doing training with your employees? You hire a new employee, right? You've got to get them up to speed. I can't believe you don't train anybody in Um So what about training old people? You ever thought of that? So when you do introduce new software, things like that, does anybody have any experience yeah, with Tony, why would we need, we know everything. Why would yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What we've done that's worked successfully for us is my father, who's the president of the company, is a number cruncher, right? And he's got his number two pencil, and he'll sit there for five hours on a Sunday morning, and he will be a computer processor for five hours. And to get him to release that and understand that, oh, now we have a point of sale system, and it can spit out that information for you. Um, we run side-by-side -side reports, and we did that for about two years, um, where we would sit down at the end of each month, and I would bring in the computer generated report and he would bring in his manual ledgers and we would look at them side by side. We'd discuss the differences, we would discuss what was matching, what wasn't, um, until we could make the computer generated report spit out the information he was looking for in a way that he wanted it. And that was actually very effective. He had to gain trust in it because there was so much knowledge that he had from crunching the numbers with a pencil and a calculator. Um, and once we were able to establish that trust, he slowly started to relinquish spending five, six hours on the weekend crunching those numbers. And that's actually freed up a tremendous amount of time. But we had to do a side by side. Thank you. You, you actually said something there that's slightly off topic, but that I think is an important thing to think about in your companies too. You talked about making the software match and show the reports the way he was used to seeing them. And so many times in, as companies, when we upgrade to software, we try to make the software produce what we're used to seeing. And personally, I think that's kind of a big mistake. The softwares that are out today have such power and complexity to them that I think you need to lean into the softwares. Look at how they can produce things in a way you haven't done it before. And there is a little discomfort getting used to that but when you kind of lean into what can these softwares really do in their native formats and how they're built, um, sometimes it really is incredible what they can do for your company instead of always trying to make them look like you're used to seeing. Um, uh, you know, so that's, that's, I think, an important takeaway in some of that stuff, too, about how you move forward on things. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely believe that there's a juggling act going on. You definitely want to lean into the new software. But as I'm dealing with, like, my father and phasing him out of the company, he is used to the way that he wants it. You know, the way I send out or the computer generates invoices is way different than he would send out an invoice. And he does not like it. But when we juggle the two things, like almost doing side by side, like you were saying, 
I'm slowly easing him and have eased him in other areas into getting in tune with the new ways. Because it really does save him a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of anger, really. Okay, any other questions? Or? I've got another topic I'll throw out there on nice. this too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, we talk about all of us are in family businesses today, but as you start to look at where do the next generations come in? I've got two kids, 13 and eight. Do they ever want to be in our business? I don't know. But as a current owner looking at that future, being cognizant of one, not necessarily putting too much pressure to force your kids into something. Because if they're forced in because they feel like they've, oh, dad's told me since I was, I could talk that someday you're going to grow up and take over the business. You know, do you build in a, a mentality to them that, well, they figure that's what their life has to be. And it's not really what they may want it to be. So I think that's something to be cautious of. Um, and then also in the same perspective is, is knowing whether your kids are even capable of stepping into those positions. So many of us, you know, we start a business, we grow a business, and you know what? Honestly, sometimes we're not even capable of running the businesses we've grown into. Um, but the idea, too, of just watching where your kids are, and is that something that they're, even if they may want to be in there, they may never be better than an installer in your company. They just may not have what it takes to run that business. And being able to recognize that and, and steer that uh, to the overall benefit of the company and not the detriment of the company uh, is something you need to be cognizant and aware of. Well, that, that's very good, Dwayne. Um, so for me, I came back to the business, almost like the story of the prodigal son. You know, I came back with open arms to the company because my father always allowed me to go out. I went to college. I went to West Virginia University for a year. I then moved to South Florida. I lived in the Fort Lauderdale, North Miami area for a year. Then I was in LA. I bounced around a lot of places. I had a lot of experiences. And then I also understood what it was like to work under somebody who wasn't your father, demanding things from you, and they're not daddy, you know, but they're definitely acting like it. And so you're able to see, you know, what actually the benefits are. But if you're always, in my opinion, you know, if you're always keeping the kid and drilling it into their head that this is what you're going to do, they don't have experiences, so they can't actually bounce anything off of their own, you know, travels to say this is what they want and this is what they don't want. And on his second point, you know, my father for a long time, since my brother's older than me, wanted my brother to be the face, my brother to be the one who was handling the books, my brother to do X, Y, and Z and really be the one leading the company. But he was always trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. My brother does not want to do that. He doesn't want to wear a suit. He doesn't want to dress nice. He doesn't want to talk in front of people. That's not my brother. He is very good at what he does, and that's polishing floors. Fantastic, one of the best I know. But that's kind of his ceiling. And my father for a long time struggled with that because it was his firstborn, his firstborn son. And he wanted to put his first, firstborn son on that pedestal, but it just didn't work. And for two, three years there, we were really struggling in the company in just a lot of areas because he was not the right man for the job. And that's no you know, disrespect to him and it's no disrespect to any of maybe your children, but sometimes it just doesn't work. You gotta put people in positions to succeed, in my opinion. I can identify with both of you. Um, you know, Tony po posed the question about the generational gap, and then we touched on succession plans and everything. Joey may not want to do this. He, uh, he enjoys it while he's there, but he also has that, you know, that whole computer thing. As I had said, I'm, you know, a handshake guy with the pickup truck and all of that, and, you know, he likes to buy everything online without going into the store. I hand him the checks to go to the bank, and he uh, puts it through the ATM rather than you know, through the teller, you know, it's, it's just, you know, the generational differences. But one thing he's been doing is the blockchain thing and, and v NFTs and things like that. And I really don't understand that. You know, I've made things, tangible things. I made this, you give me $10 for it. And, you know, that's, that's our business transaction where he's got that whole digital way of thinking and, you know, generational thing of thinking. And he may do well. I know that he's made some money just by clicking a few buttons with that uh, N NFT stuff. So, uh, you know, he may not want to, and I'm not gonna force him into it, you know? Yeah, and I think that's uh, an important consideration growing up in our family business. Both my father and my brother, being the firstborn, felt they were compelled to be in the business. 
And personally, I separated my children from that situation and told them, you know, in other words, they were precluded from working for the company for five years after they got out of college. Why? They got to get some life experience. I mean, how do you understand the pressures of going in for a job interview if you never went in for a job interview? Or, you know, making ends meet and there wasn't somebody there to, you know, help you along. Um, so those are all things I think should be considered. I, th I think the other thing is, as a, as a parent or as a family member, understand that all of our children are outliers. Because you've been sitting around that kitchen table from the time you could probably understand their communication until you go into the business and you've heard the terms, you know, I don't know how many people know what oxalic acid is, but I bet you do, right? Okay? So you, you depend on these people, you've, you've had them help you, it was a good experience, it was part of a learning experience, right? They learned how to work, right? But they're an outlier, they're an, they're an advanced, brand new employee. So don't mistake that with, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Alexander and Dwayne said. You know, just because they're your family member doesn't mean they're the right person for that job. And I think their happiness should be probably more important than the success of the business. Um, any other questions? Yes. Second generation, or third or fourth, um, do you have an exit strategy for yourself and for the business? Like, do you sell it? Do you ESOP or? My, my accountant suggested that if I plan on selling it, I pay myself differently. I go through different type types of booking, whether I'm doing a draw or salary or, you know, paying my wife in lieu of myself. So it's an expense, you know, things like that to make that profit number at the bottom of the PL bigger, you know, although I'll have to pay taxes on it. So it's, 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 a, it's a juggling act. And if I, you know, it's, he said, if you plan on selling it, let's do this for two or three years to get that number. As I said, in the beginning, I had it evaluated in a profit year. It was this. And in a, you know, year there, there was a lot of depre, uh, depreciation and and you know the the actual net profit was down here then it was worth like a fraction I think you it depends a little bit on your situation you know if you've got the people as a second tier of management that could potentially take over and run the company um, then potentially you could look at selling it out to to them or to some sort of ESOT type program um, or whether you have to look at going out to a third party to try to sell it. Um, like Buddy said, though, too, is, you know, when you're looking to sell it out, you know, you need to be real careful for a couple of years, get your, your numbers and your books right where you want them for that kind of thing to maximize your, your valuations on that. Unless Dwayne wants to move into your neighborhood. Well, we, we discussed that in our family meetings. I mean, my position is it's always for sale. If the right number comes around and it benefits the family, it's always for sale. So it's not like we're holding on to the company to ensure transition. It's, it's a business. And I, and I would echo that as well. I, I think you have to plan to sell your company at any time. And if COVID has taught us anything, I think it's probably taught us that we don't have necessarily as much stability in the world as we may want. So you should be able, at any time, to sell that company within a week, two weeks. To uh, take it a, a little off topic, but I think Mike is really on to something. The last two years, my family has been doing um, family business meetings, and we've been sitting down off location, not in our house, you know, not anywhere familiar, going somewhere to dinner, sitting down, booking out a room, and really sitting down and talking and being transparent with one another. It's helped with the trust between the brothers individually and then our relationship and all the dynamics with our father because there's so many dynamics when you're dealing in a family business but if you can you know sitting down with whoever is involved in the top tier management of your company or maybe it's the family however you guys structure it is really important it's been super helpful fam the family meetings once a year has been i mean i can't speak enough of it it's really good so we only have one minute so we're going to end shortly but I do have one that I'll throw one more question out. So are the spouses attending the family meetings? Uh, no. <laughs> no. I no. am the meeting. 
<laughs> no, they don't. You are the meeting. Tune in for next year. <laughs> we could do a whole hour just on spousal relationships in family businesses. So uh, I would like to, our time is up, but I would like to thank the uh, panelists um, for your time. Thank you for your questions and participating. And as well, the panelists will be down at the uh, Natural Stone Institute booth, which is N529. So if you want to have further discussion or further questions, or maybe you have questions you didn't want to ask in public, um, you've got a pretty good idea of their background. Okay, So you can certainly ask um, any one of them any of your questions down at the, down at the uh, NSI booth. So I appreciate your participation. Thank you. Don't forget about the, we have a uh, NSI reception upstairs uh, around, I think they, it's in the hallway between rooms 26, N261 and 264. Come on up and have a drink. 5.30 tonight. 5.30. All right. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Thank you.